Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Today in Ukraine, Russian forces are continuing their devastating attacks on civilians while Ukrainians put up a fierce fight to preserve their democracy. And here in Washington, we saw our democracy in action as the Senate began the historic confirmation hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, the very first black woman ever nominated for the Supreme Court. Senator A.B. Klobuchar drew that connection between Ukraine and the U.S. Senate hearing today. Judge, your confirmation hearing comes at a moment in our history when the people of this country are once again seeing, this time in Ukraine, that democracy can never be taken for granted. Eternal vigilance, it's been said, is the price of liberty. Senators such as Cory Booker also emphasize the historic barrier-breaking nature of Judge Jackson's nomination. This is not a normal day for America. We have never had this moment before. Judge Jackson's nomination breaks an artificially confining mold of our past and opens up a more promising, potential-filled future for us all as Americans. It signals that this nation will draw more deeply from all of our talent and genius that will benefit all Americans. As Booker said, Judge Jackson's nomination is good, not just good for black women and all people of color, but for all Americans, because we don't have to limit ourselves anymore to people of one gender or race. Sounds like a good thing. We can draw from all talented people in our multiracial democracy. But still, in some ways, it was just another normal day in the Senate and another typical confirmation hearing, because we did hear remarks like this from Senator Thomas Cotton. So I want to be clear about what would convince me to support any Supreme Court nominee. I'm looking for a justice who will uphold the Constitution, not use it to invent new so-called rights. I'm looking for a justice who understands that the Constitution means what it says and does not mean what it doesn't say. Someone who understands that it is not up to nine unaccountable, unelected politicians in black robes decide some new evolving meaning of the Constitution based on public opinion polling or views of the legal elite. Did you hear his reference to, quote, new so-called rights? It's interesting. He says this just as the Supreme Court is probably about to either gut fully or overturn our right to reproductive freedom. But conservatives like Cotton harken back to the Constitution as it was written over 200 years ago when black Americans like Judge Jackson were enslaved and women were not equal citizens. And through all of the commentary like this from Republicans today, Judge Jackson kept smiling and listening calmly. I could learn a thing or two from her. When it was finally her turn, she seemed to know exactly how to answer senators like Cotton. Members of this committee, if I am confirmed, I commit to you that I will work productively to support and defend the Constitution and this grand experiment of American democracy that has endured over these past 246 years. I have been a judge for nearly a decade now, and I take that responsibility and my duty to be independent very seriously. I decide cases from a neutral posture. I evaluate the, the facts and I interpret and apply the law to the facts of the case before me without fear or favor, consistent with my judicial oath. Joining us are Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and Yamish Al Sindor the Washington correspondent for NBC News and host of Washington Week. And she will be there just in a moment. She's dialing in. Uh, so, Jeffrey, I want to start with you because your is dialing in. Uh, what were your top takeaways from the first day of hearings? Obviously, we didn't get into the questioning just yet, uh, but opening statements and also Judge Jackson's statement. The top takeaway is Judge Jackson's statement because we learned so much about her and her commitment to the Constitution. That statement that you just played came after she quoted Justice Breyer, her former boss, 
talking about in his own confirmation hearings how the law can help people live in a more harmonious way so they can work productively together. And she signaled that she embraced that pragmatic philosophy of using the law to help people live harmoniously together. And I just thought it was so moving to hear her, as she did in her statement at the White House, beginning by uh, thanking God. She said, I must reaffirm my thanks to God for a faith that sustains me at this moment. And then among the other blessings, she thanked her parents. She mentioned that her dad was a University of Miami law school student, and she remembered his law books on the kitchen table. She thanked her younger brother, Keith, who was a public uh, police officer and then joined the armed services. She thanked her high school debate coach. And then she thanked her two daughters, Talia and Lilia. She said, it hasn't always been easy. Um, and I fully admit, I didn't always get the balance right. But I hope you've seen that hard work, determination, and love, it can be done. So, you know, it's, it's typical to say these confirmation hearings are a kabuki theater and we can't learn anything. We can learn a lot just from seeing Judge Jackson and hearing her, her extraordinary power, her commitment to the law, her commitment to interpreting the Constitution neutrally, her love for her family, her faith. All of that is just a unique opportunity. So I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days just to hear more of her. The, the questions are what they are. You know, there is a kind of uh, there, you know, stage quality to it, to the politics of it. But this is our last chance to just hear and see the brilliant Judge Jackson. And as you said, Zerlina, so powerfully, this historic moment when no one can think that they can be excluded from the court because of their background, their race, their gender. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a very inspiring moment for America. Yamish, hello. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It's so great to have you. Uh, the Washington Post did a graphic showing that Judge Jackson may in some ways be more qualified than the current justices on the court. She literally checks all of the boxes. And it made me think of the quote uh, that we all say all the time, which is, you have to work twice as far to get twice as hard to get half. You have to work twice as hard to get half as far. So speak to this idea uh, that you can't just be qualified when you're a black woman for this particular position. You have to be extra, extra qualified for this position. Well, Zerlina, African Americans for generations have really been passing down the idea that um, they need that their children really need to be excellent, and that, um, I, from, based on my reporting, is something that Judge Jackson heard. Um, at one point, one of her friends was talking about the idea that she asked her, um, "Why did why are you getting A's in classes when I'm getting B's?" And she said, "Well, my mother and my parents said that if there's someone in the class that can get an A, it should be me." So in her in her mm. speech, she she nodded to that. She talked about her parents and the example that they that they had for her. Um, and I, based on my reporting and talking to her her friends. I should also say that her parents were people who were not just exemplifying education. Both of them went to historically black colleges and universities, her father being a lawyer, her mother being Dr. Brown and being a principal. But also, they were very involved. Her friends told me that her dad would often call up um, and say, you should go to this event at Harvard. You should go to this lecture, this mini teaching course. And some of her friends told me they don't even know how um, Mr. Brown got to know about those things, because there was no Google at the time. But they really found that, that her parents wanted her to get everything that she possibly she could get out of Harvard. Um, and also, I, something that I've been hearing from people who are critics of Republicans who have been questioning um, her time on the Sentencing Commission, who have been trying to tie her to the idea that she was soft on crime, they've been saying, essentially, that all of these claims are are a distraction to and really an excuse for Republicans not to vote for someone that they see as highly qualified as someone who has been working their entire life to get to this moment. One of the things, Jeffrey, that came up today was this idea of so-called rights, the creation of so-called rights. And I can't help but think of what Yamish just said about the fact that this is historic representation of an eminently qualified human being who's a black woman, first black woman ever nominated. But what so-called rights are, are these senators talking about were inventing, um, you know, by selecting justices on this part of this political spectrum? When, when you look at the court, it just has not represented the American public. I mean, obviously, the original intention of the Constitution saying that when you're looking at Katanji Brown Jackson just seems a little bit funny to do with a straight face, no? 
Uh, yes, it, yes, it does. And that phrase, so-called rights, is very significant, as you say. It's really interesting which rights the Republican senators are now questioning. Senator Marsha Blackburn is questioning Judge Jackson about whether she supports Griswold versus Connecticut, the 1966 case that said that there's a right of married couples to use contraception. That's the basis for Roe v. Wade. But previously, no Republican nominee, no, Ju Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, questioned Griswold. It suggests how dramatically uh, certain Republican senators want to cut back on rights that have been part of our laws and traditions for more than 50 years. And of course, there's a vigorous debate about other rights that the Supreme Court is recognizing that also aren't written down in the Constitution, like the idea that state legislatures can overturn the you know, results of elections after state courts have already ruled on them. So we're, we're in the middle of a very pitched battle about the meaning of the Constitution. Uh, right now, it is not a simple matter of just reading it or making up rights, as Senator Cotton said. And it's so significant that Judge Jackson, who's going to be in such an important role, both in dissent and in the majority, has the confidence, the power, the commitment to resisting these simplistic claims and giving a vision of a constitution that protects all Americans. Really helpful analysis there. And Yamis, Jackson will be the only mother on the court besides Amy Coney Barrett. We remember how Republicans uh, used that aspect of her background at her confirmation hearings. I want to play this clip and get your reaction on the other side. Girls, I know it has not been easy as I've tried to navigate the challenges of juggling my career and motherhood. And I fully admit that I did not always get the balance right. But I hope that you've seen that with hard work, determination, and love, it can be done. I mean, what is your reaction to the fact that she's speaking in these terms at a confirmation hearing? Obviously, we saw how it was utilized as a part of Amy Coney Barrett's biography. How do you think it's resonating coming from Judge Jackson today? Well, it's really Judge Jackson introducing herself, not just to these senators, but to the nation, and really telling uh, the, the the senators what's important to her. And her friends told me that family and supporting her husband, her children, but also her friends, it's something that is very, very um, important to Judge Jackson. I was talking to one of her friends who told me that even in the midst of all of this, um, she was still texting her friends at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, talking about their children. She was still um, providing support support to a friend whose grandmother passed away. Antoinette Coakley told me, one of her friends, who also, I should say, predicted that she would be the first black woman on the Supreme Court way back when they were in college at Harvard, because she saw in her friend, she told me, this balance of someone who could be brilliant and be, and be taking a lot of classes and be convening study groups in her dorm room, but also someone who would stop a, a classmate um, on the way to, to, to finals to say, hey, do you have enough pencils? That's what, what Judge Rutledge, another African-American judge, um, and, and now law professor told me. So, really, it's not surprising that you saw that balance. There's also, of course, one other thing, which is that one of those daughters wrote a letter to President Obama, former President Obama, saying that their mother deserved to be on the Supreme Court. So, while she was saying, you know, that she hasn't balanced motherhood and working, what she has done is create some daughters who are not at all fearful of saying, I know what's best for my mother, I know what's best for this country, and you should be hiring this woman who birthed me to, put, to be on the Supreme Court. So, she has some bold children um, who were not at all quiet. In, in asking for her mother, for their mother to, to have this job. And I think that that tells you a little bit about who she is, but also who her family is. I love that so much. That is so amazing. I mean, it was, it was a great day today to start off the week, just in terms of the history, um, you know, not getting into any of the politics. I think historic moments like this, we need to relish them. Jeffrey Rosen and Yamish Alcindor. Yamish is your peacock debut, so I have to say thank you for joining us and uh, debuting on our show. We really appreciate both of you for starting us off tonight. Thanks so much. Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is so eminently qualified to be a Supreme Court justice that some Republican senators really had to stretch the truth to try to criticize her, like Josh Hawley of Missouri, who tried to smear Judge Jackson over her past sentences for child porn offenders. A few things that I'm concerned about, aspects of your record that, that trouble me. Seven cases that represent, as near as we can tell, all of Judge Jackson's cases dealing with child pornography from her time on the district court. The defendant possessed dozens of images of child pornography 
and uh, distributed, I should say distributed, dozens of images of child pornography. Prosecutor recommended 72 months. Judge Jackson gave the defendant 60 months, which was the lowest sentence permitted by the law. So Holly is suggesting that Jackson has gone easy on child porn, which he may think will grab headlines and turn the public against her. There is just one problem, though. He's completely misrepresenting the facts because other federal judges have also imposed lighter sentences than sentencing guidelines, including some that Holly voted to confirm. Even the conservative National Review today slammed Holly's attacks as, quote, disingenuous. And I flagged that this morning because I was like, wow, even the National Review is calling him out. Joining us now are Mark Joseph Stern, staff writer for Slate. Also with us, Ellie Mastel, justice correspondent for The Nation. Ellie, let me start with you. What are your takeaways from the hearing today and the GOP senators' opening statements and their lines of attack? Yeah, they don't really have anything substantive against the nominee. Um, if you actually read her cases, her, her decisions are very mainstream, maybe a little left-leaning, but still kind of main center mass of where we are in America. They don't have substances of tax, so all they can do is, is gin up this kind of nonsense um, about her record in a few cases that we're seeing from Hawley and we're seeing um, from Marsha Blackburn. Um, the facts of her positions on sentencing child pornographers is that she sentences them she sentences them to jail for a very long time um the difference here is that our sentencing guidelines uh for 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 child porn um are even higher uh, than a lot of people think they should be i personally am not one of those people i'm very carceral when it comes to um, um sentencing child pornographers um and yet i don't see a huge difference between where i am and where Judge Jackson has been throughout her career, um, if they were willing to get into the nuances of that, I think that would be made more obvious. But Hawley's not interested in nuance. He's interested in riling up the QAnon crazies. And the last thing I'll just rem remind people of is that Kataji Brown Jackson actually sentenced the Pizzagate guy. So the actual violent terrorist who like came at people over these child pornography things, it is Kataji Brown Jackson who put him in jail for four years. That is a fun fact. Thank you for sharing today. Um, Mark, in terms of the lines of attack you heard from Republicans today, I was talking with Jeffrey Rosen about this idea that, you know, they want in a, you know, folks who are interpreting the Constitution in its original text. And I always find that interesting as a black woman. Um, but in terms of that idea that the court is becoming too activist and we want people to read the original text. How did that land with what's looming out here in the real Supreme Court in the real world? Well, it's just so incredibly difficult to take those arguments seriously from Republican senators when we have a Supreme Court today that has embraced living constitutionalism to a radical and unprecedented degree. I mean, this court has, under the banner of originalism, made up vast new swaths of law with absolutely no roots in the original public meaning of the Constitution. I'm thinking about uh, decisions expanding the right to bear arms, uh, decisions hobbling public sector unions, decisions striking down civil rights laws, all kinds of decisions that at times the court will even admit are not complying with the original meaning of the Constitution, but do follow the majority's ideological and political preferences. So, you know, I think it would be great if Judge Jackson could say, well, unlike the current six conservative justices, I will take the written text of the Constitution seriously. I will take the original public meaning seriously. I will not start from my conclusion and then formulate a laughably nonsensical pseudo-historical claim to make it seem like my political beliefs are rooted in American tradition and history. Of course, she's not going to do that, but it would be a very satisfying moment for Ellie and me and a lot of other lawyers. Man, it would be satisfying if somebody did that at one of these hearings. I wanted to do it. I was yelling at the TV today, Ellie, because I was like, you're going to sit in front of a black woman and say, we really all should abide by the original text of the Constitution. And act a black like, woman. You realize and, and, you're talking to a black woman. <laughs> and act like the, the rights that we have now are made up. I mean, that's Tom Cotton's actual argument. But here's the other thing, Zerlina. Like, look, today was not the day for this. Today was the day for opening statements. When we get into it, I'm going to need Democrats 
to step up to the plate and defend this person. If you notice, Republicans are still litigating the Brett Kavanaugh situation, right? Still litigating the alleged attempt at rapist and making some kind of uh, connection uh, to the treatment that he received and the treatment that they are going to go above and beyond to give to uh, the Judge Jackson. I need Democrats to have that same kind of energy and to not let these smears, these pedophile smears slide, to not give Republicans an inch. And I didn't exactly see all of that fire today. It was still today, even in this, these opening statements, we saw we saw Republicans on the attack and Democrats in the kind of like, oh, your bio, it's so awesome. Like, I want them to hit back. And tomorrow is going to be the Democrats' opportunity to really hit back at their colleagues and defend this woman like Republicans have defended alleged attempt at rapist Brett Kavanaugh and alleged sexual harasser Clarence Thomas in the past. I mean, I think one of the things I thought of today, Ellie, is the fact that Republicans... They want you to remember that there were protesters at Brett Kavanaugh's hearing. They don't want you to remember the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford. They don't want you to remember that. And that was the most important part for me that I won't forget. So just, I wanted to, to make that point. Uh, Mark, we, we heard lots of Republican buzzwords today, including critical race theory, which has absolutely nothing to do with the Supreme Court at all whatsoever. So I don't know why they brought it up. Is this just Republicans practicing uh, their pitches for their midterm elections commercials? Uh, I feel like Senators Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, they just want to run for president. And so this was them cutting their ads so that they can fundraise and do that, right? Absolutely. It's it's basically a Fox News audition reel, a midterm ad reel, uh, just a, a kind of warm up for the midterm season that we're about to enter when uh, every Republican will be falling over themselves to try to prove that they took the hardest thwack at Katanji Brown Jackson. They are trying to make her seem scary. They are trying to make her seem soft on crime, soft on pedophiles. They don't have one particularly coherent or cohesive line of attack. So they're throwing it all against the wall and figuring at the end of the day, um, they can just cut some pretty decent clips for attack ads uh, down the road. It's not an effective way to keep Jackson off the Supreme Court. And I think they know that. You don't really see a lot of uh, ambition among the Republicans to really keep this woman from getting confirmed. Instead, you see a desire to grandstand, a desire to make these ridiculous speeches and accusations, a desire to use this as a moment in the sun to try to build your own brand. I mean, hell, Ted Cruz was hawking his podcast during today's hearings. This is barely even about Jackson at moments <laughs> like that. And and I think it's probably a bit of a relief for her because she gets to take a time out and just have a moment of zen. But it's pretty embarrassing for the rest of them to watch them just do brand building when they're supposed to be questioning a Supreme Court moment. That was a moment. And I have to say, I have a lot of questions for the, the folks seeking out Ted Cruz's podcast. I just have, I just have questions. I have a couple, a list. I have a whole list of questions as to what you are doing with your life choices. Um, there are a lot of podcasts Ellie. you can get in Cancun about the politics, though. So, really <laughs> so I, I understand. That's funny. So, Ellie, another Republican senator, Iowa Senate, Senator Chuck Grassley, who actually started off uh, this statement on the Republican side. He's a ranking member. Um, he slammed far right. For far left groups, excuse me. See, I just, I'm so used to saying it. Far left dark money groups uh, and their role in ju the judicial selection process. I mean, fact, just fact check this for us because he specifically called out demand justice, which is like five minutes old. So, um, what is your response to that as someone affiliated with them? Yeah, so I'm a board member of Demand Justice, and I just want to say very clear, I did not get to pick the nominee. I don't, she never, I've never met her. We didn't, we didn't, we, didn't, we don't hang out. I mean, I know it's hard for Republicans to understand this sometimes, but like black people do not all hang out in the same barbecue. Um, we all love each other. Um, yeah, so Demand Justice did not pick this nominee. Demand, uh, you know, from my part, I'm, I think this is a good nominee. I think this was a good pick. Obviously, I, I think that for a long time, uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson has been the front runner to replace Stephen Breyer, having clerked for Breyer and having been seriously vetted for the for, for the position that eventually went to Merrick Garland. So it's no big surprise that she's there. The thought that Demand Justice picked this woman um, um, is ridiculous. And trust me, I know that because the Federalist Society picks Republican judges. I would love for us to have that kind of 
you know, the kind of power within the Democratic Party to be like, we're going to nominate this person and not that person. That would be great, but we don't have that power. The Fed stock does on their side. So really what Grasserly is doing is what the kids call projecting. That is what you call that. I mean, I, I find it, I found it amusing be only because it's almost like, yeah, the left wishes they could do what you're, you're accusing them of being able to do when you guys are the ones who do it all the time. Like, just with the last pick, just, we just did this. Mark Joseph Stern and Ellie Mustel, thank you so much for being here. Great to have you both for this analysis. Please stay safe. Coming up. As history is made here in the U.S. with the momentous Supreme Court confirmation hearing of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, history of a different kind is unfolding in Ukraine as Russia continues its brutal assault. We'll go live to Ukraine for the latest, and we'll be right back after this. Twenty-six days into Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, a senior NATO official says both sides could be nearing a stalemate. That official tells NBC News that Russia has struggled to gain momentum in the war, but is growing increasingly brutal in its efforts to bomb Ukraine into submission, a tactic that so far hasn't worked. Today, Ukraine rejected a demand from Russia that it will surrender the besieged southern port city of Mariupol. Up to 300,000 people are believed to be trapped there without any access to water, heating, and medicine as Russian forces indiscriminately pummel hospitals, apartments, and storefronts. Meanwhile, the city of Kyiv was rocked over the weekend by one of the heaviest strikes to hit Ukraine's capital thus far, a shopping center reduced to nothing by a long-range missile strike. Ukrainian officials say at least eight people are dead from the attack, though they're still working to determine an official death toll. Russia also seems to be targeting more locations in western Ukraine, like the city of Lviv, once viewed as a safe haven to Ukrainians due to its proximity to Poland, a NATO ally. Missiles have now targeted a military base, an airport, and also an airport just miles away from the once bustling western city. NBC's Jacob Soboroff was in Lviv today amid the frequent ringing of air raid sirens. You can hear that noise. It's the fourth air raid siren of the day here in Lviv. The fourth. The first one started early this morning in the 1 o'clock a.m. hour. Uh, it's now after 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can see, strangely, people are still out on the streets. People are still walking around. There's a bomb shelter over there. Uh, come this way a little bit. I can show you. It's inside uh, that building there on the corner. Uh, just in the last hour, the last air raid siren, I saw people screaming inside there. Now uh, it seems like people are approaching uh, yet again. This has become a constant thing here in Lviv, but four in one day, uh, this is the most I've heard. Joining me now to discuss from Ukraine is Maria Abdiva, research director for the European Expert Association. Maria, I want to start with this tweet that you sent. I have already seen more destruction and death in those 20, 26 days than in my entire life. What are you hearing on the ground from millions of people? still in Ukraine, as Russia just deliberately targets places where there are civilians. Yes, uh, I'm staying in Kharkiv for this uh, 26 days. This is my home city. I do not want to leave, uh, and I want to stay and uh, show people in the world what are Russian war crimes here. And uh, I try to go out uh, as much as I can, because it's possible only during uh, the short day hours, because we have a, a curfew, and then uh, the streets are deserted, and it is uh, quite dangerous to be outside because of the constant shelling. So Russia didn't manage to get any kind of control over Kharkiv. Uh, they, they, the Russian troops are now situated on the north and northeast of the city. They tried several times to get into the city, but it, actually it failed. Uh, these attempts failed, and they were fought back uh, with, uh, by Ukrainian troops very effectively. And Russian troops are now stalled on their positions. Uh, and that means that Kharkiv has possibility to 
to, to function in uh, the roads for on the south and west of the city, but still the, the living in the city under constant shelling is bombardment and was very difficult, especially for residential areas, because people are left there without heating, electricity, water supply. Many people are hiding in the subways. I have been to the subway station and have seen my mother with her baby, uh, baby that was born already during this war, and they are living for three weeks in the uh, train cabin, uh, the underground cabin uh, down uh, down uh, there. So uh, people are in very difficult situation, and Russia deliberately is creating this kind of humanitarian crisis by bombarding and shelling residential areas. They do not target any kind of civilian objects. They do terrorize the civilians to threaten people and to make them flee the city. So is that, from your perspective, how you see it um, in terms of Russia's goal, is to target those civilian areas, apartment buildings, the subway where people are hiding, as you just described, in order to either get people to flee and become refugees or to kill them and essentially remove them from the area. Um, because from his, from his mouth, he's talked about Ukraine as it almost doesn't exist. It's, it's Russia in his brain. Absolutely. That's, you know, the same the same kind of thinking we have seen uh, by he what was in Hitler's mind during Nazi Germany. Actually, Kharkiv survived Nazi occupation, and, this, and now these old buildings that were here during Nazi occupation, they are now destroyed by, because Russia is dropping bombs on top of them. So th that was, we have seen already during the Soviet era, when uh, the, the tactics was to destroy people, to put as much pre people in, in camp, to send them to Siberia to die, and all this just to destroy physically. This we see what is happening in Mariupol, where Russia is having a city encircled. This this kind of uh, of thinking we see in other small towns around Kharkiv, which are under Russian control at the moment, and they do not allow any medical help inside the city. They do not allow to evacuate people. Today, uh, the buses with children in uh, near Mariupol, which were evacuating children, were, uh, were under shelling, and we don't know yet the numbers of the uh, how many casualties or wounded children were there. So that is the the, the tactics of terrorizing and uh, war crimes, because uh, this is deliberately all these um, attacks are targeting deliberately civilians to threaten them and uh, to to uh, because Russia cannot do anything on the ground. They cannot do anything with the military means because Russian soldiers are not ready to fight. They put down their weapons. They surrender. They do not want to get into direct fight with Ukrainian troops because Ukrainian troops are virusly resistant, and Russian troops do not have any morale. They came here like invaders. No mm -hmm. one, so people in Kharkiv call, call them uh, Russian occupiers or Russian Nazis. That's the only name for Russian troops I now hear. And Kharkiv was and is a Russian-speaking city and used once to be like in normal relations with the neighboring country. And now all people uh, have uh, against Russia is, you know, this kind of aggression and uh, calling them Nazis. I mean, one of the things you referenced was uh, history. We learned earlier today that a 96-year-old Holocaust survivor was reportedly among the victims killed during the Russia assault, Russian assault on Kharkiv last week. Um, and so it's, it's incredible when, when you think about the fact that he survived Hitler and died uh, at the hands of Vladimir Putin. Uh, Maria Abdiva, thank you so much for being here today. Please stay safe. Before we go to break, this morning, a China Eastern Airlines flight crashed in southern China with 132 souls on board. Rescuers are searching for survivors, but right now there is no word of any or of what caused the crash. The flight was a domestic one heading to and from cities in southern China, and the country's aviation administration says the plane lost contact just over 160 miles from the flight's destination. The plane was a Boeing 737. 
but it was not the same model involved in the Indonesian Ethiopia crashes. That was a Boeing 737 MAX. This Boeing model, the 737-800NG, has a good safety record and is actually considered one of the safest aircrafts ever made. The NTSB has appointed an investigator as the U.S. representative looking into the crash, and the investigation will be led by China's Aviation Administration. Coming up, the war in Ukraine has left millions running for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. And even though they might now be safe elsewhere in Europe, how are the youngest victims, Ukrainian kids, dealing with the Russia invasion and leaving everything they know behind? We'll have a report when we're back. Over 3 million refugees have fled Ukraine. The U.N. estimates that at least 1.5 million of them are children. Some are fleeing Ukraine with their mothers as the men in their family must stay behind. And while hundreds of other children are crossing Ukrainian border, border excuse me, without their parents, NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber spoke to children who made it to Poland and are staying inside of those refugee camps. When you watch children playing in the makeshift refugee shelters now scattered across Poland, you see a lot of smiles. Talk to the same kids, and you get the sense that they laugh and play, not because they're unaware of the horrors they survived, but because it is their way to survive those moments in hell. What is war? So the war is when everybody is in a battle and they are they're fighting. And we saw we saw equipment, we saw vehicles, and then I don't remember anything. It's a river of blood. It's it's loud noises. It's it's terrible. It's hard to talk about scary things, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. We don't even have our house anymore. Over three million refugees have fled Ukraine. What's her name? Tatiana. UNICEF says half are children, like Margarita and her sister Zlata. Before all of this started, what were you doing? Do того, как все началось, чем ты занималась, какие у тебя были планы? My plans were to go out, to hang out, to study, but not to leave. I wanted to be an actress. How have you changed in the last two weeks? Do you feel like you've had to grow up? I started, I started to value everything I have as much as I never did before. I, I worry about everyone now. I worry about my relatives, my loved ones. For the older kids, there's a determination, a necessity to help. I'm looking for my little sister and my little brother try to help them. Has that been hard? Because you're just a kid too. Uh, not so hard. Pain, instead of fueling hate, galvanizing compassion. How do you do that? How do you find love in the middle of all this? Because you remember, remember what you had before, before the war. You remember what kind of good life you had, and you start missing it a lot. What do you want other kids who might watch this? What do you want them to know? I want, I want to reach them happiness, and I want them to live good life. And, uh, and clear, safe sky over their heads. Ellison Barber, Armamov, Poland. Ellison Barber, thank you for that excellent report. It's hard for me to see the babies. Uh, I'm a human. All right, switching gears. COVID-19, it's not going anywhere. In fact, in much of Europe and in parts of Asia right now, a new Omicron subvariant is driving up infections. Disney Shanghai announced it's again closing its doors as China fights its biggest COVID surge since the virus first emerged in Wuhan more than two years ago. South Korea is currently leading the world in new cases, averaging more than 380,000 new cases every single day. Over in England, health, health authorities are now offering a second booster shot to millions of its most vulnerable citizens. That decision comes as new case reports there rose 
by nearly 80 percent over the course of two weeks. Chief White House Medical Advisor Anthony Fauci says the ongoing surge globally could soon mean more cases here at home. The bottom line is we likely will see an uptick in cases uh, as we've seen in the European countries, particularly the UK, where they've had the same situation as we've had now. They have a BA2. They have a relaxation of some of the restrictions, such as indoor masking. And there's a waning of immunity. Hopefully, we won't see a surge. I don't think we will. Joining me now, Dr. Uche Blackstock. She's the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity. And Dr. Blackstock, I just feel like, okay, do you feel like you're having deja vu? Because that's how I feel, right? Help us understand Absolutely. when Europe is seeing a surge, South Korea surprisingly is seeing a surge. And I, I'd love your analysis on why you think that is. You're seeing parts of China seeing large rises in cases. I mean, are we going to have the same thing happen here? What is your assessment of how much of a risk this BA2 subvariant is to the United States? Francine, Selena, thank you so much for having me. I mean, definitely this is deja vu. And definitely, as the pattern has been in the past, whatever typically happens in Western Europe, especially UK, uh, eventually happens here within a matter of weeks to months. And so I think that we need to use this time to prepare and prevent. And I, what I would love to see is some sort of alert system that we had here in the U.S. to mm -hmm. say, OK, this is what's happening overseas. This is what's likely to happen here. This is how we're going to prepare. I would love to hear the CDC invited administration do that. I think that the community levels that the CDC came out with, the revised ones, they rely too heavily on, on hospitalizations and hospital capacity, which are lagging indicators. We need to be ahead of of the surges in other places. And right now, and that's not clear that's happening. I think the reason why we're seeing surges in Asia is because one, this variant is so highly transmissible. Um, two, they've done such a great job of, of really locking down that there are many people that are still vulnerable that have not gotten it. And they also have elderly populations. So disproportionately elderly populations. So for all of those reasons, that's why we're seeing high cases and hospitalizations in those areas. And, I'm, and I don't know if Dr. Fauci knows something that I don't know or my colleagues don't know, but I do think that we need to prepare for a surge here and prepare for the worst because we know that most of the Western European countries actually have higher vaccination rates, higher booster rates than the U.S. does. So that was exactly what I was thinking as I listened to him. Um, and I, I keep thinking about the fact that it's not just that you're, we, as Europe goes, we follow, right? It's also that we, we took away all of our precautions. We took away masking and, and the mandates uh, that were at least helping uh, keep the numbers down to a certain extent. I mean, the fact, is it poor timing to have this BA2 variant circulating as transmissible as it is, as you, as you say it is, with the fact that we took away all of our precautions and we're not putting them back? Yeah. No, absolutely. I think the COVID precautions were withdrawn prematurely, right? We were still having over a thousand people a day die. And, I, and actually, that was incredibly disrespectful and impractical um, to pull back precautions so early. And, and for some reason, um, our, our leadership thought there wasn't going to be another surge soon. But we've seen how the last two years have played out. And instead of pulling back on mask mandates, instead of pulling back on vaccine requirements, we should have kept them in place and ensured that more people get vaccinated and boosted, right, to prepare everyone for the next surge. And we know that with these Omicron variants, these subvariants, that being boosted is especially important to protecting you against infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. And that's where really the focus should be right now. So one of the things that I, I, I wanted to ask you as you were saying that getting boosted is your best chance against these new variants that keep popping up um, is the fact that we actually don't have a high level of completely boosted, total, fully vaccinated people, right? The, the people that have had three shots, not just two shots. Can you talk about whether or not we're going to need a fourth shot and how that's going to work with the fact that we're in a country where, sure, we have people that have had the two shots, right. but not the booster and the fact that they're going to need another booster soon. Right. Okay. So about half of people that are eligible to be boosted 
have gotten boosted. So we have a whole other half of people that still haven't been boosted. About 75% of people over 65 that are eligible for boosters have been boosted, but we really need to get those numbers higher up. In terms of that fourth dose, I would say the evidence is very conflicting. Right now, you know, we know that people who are immunocompromised are approved for that fourth dose, but the data regarding whether or not people who, the general population, whether they need that fourth dose, it really still is not clear. Um, some other countries mm -hmm. have been approved that fourth dose for people who are elderly or people who, are, who have uh, comorbidities, like high blood pressure, obesity. I think Israel has done that. But right now, to be honest, it's not clear that that fourth dose is indicated for the general population. And we're having enough difficulty trying to get that third dose into people. And yeah. we, can't, we can't forget about global vaccine inequity. There are 3 billion people who still have not been vaccinated or they're not fully vaccinated. And we really need to focus on getting the rest of the world vaccinated because that contributes to the emergence of these variants. So the White House asked Congress for $22 billion more in COVID funds to cover treatments, tests, vaccines, research. Republicans are saying no because of the price tag. But what actually happens if Congress doesn't pass this additional funding? How much will it hurt our opportunity to get ahead right. of the next variant to come? Right. And that's why this like next potential surge is so scary, because we are seriously going to be unprepared. So that funding covers testing and treatment for people who are uninsured. It covers the cost of antivirals and monoclonal antibodies. Um, it also covers the cost of vaccine research. So research going into developing variant specific vaccines, which we know are incredibly important. And it goes toward uh, disseminating and distributing vaccines in other parts of the world, especially in low income countries. And so what does that mean? It means that we are going to be incredibly unprepared um, for this next surge. It means that more people can get sick, be hospitalized, and die. And so that, that's why that funding is just critically important, especially at this time where we are right now. It's really, really scary. Um, but I'm so grateful to you for your expertise in helping us figure out how to survive through all of this. Dr. Uche Blackstock, thank you so much, as always, for being here. And please stay safe. Coming up, Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson's confirmation hearing is beyond historic, and we'll talk about what her presence and experience means for our culture as a whole when we come back. Today's confirmation hearing of Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson is more than just a moment in history. It's a moment for little black girls to look up at their TV screens and see this extremely qualified black woman with glasses, rocking locks, and see themselves. The hearing comes just days after the House passed the Crown Act, which would ban discrimination against traditional race or ethnic ethnically based hairstyles, like Judge Jackson's locks, a hairstyle that has a long history of being deemed as unprofessional and now is being seen on the woman who will likely be our next Supreme Court justice. Joining me now is Robin Autry, chair of the sociology department at Wesleyan University. And professor, in your think piece for NBC Think, you write the history of, of law, dreadlocks in particular communicates this legacy. The name dates to British colonists' distaste for the matted hair of Kenyan warriors, which they described as nasty and dreadful. That origin explains why some prefer the word locks over dreadlocks. And I love this because my mother, uh, for many years, maybe like 20 years, has had locks. And she would always, always correct people who came up to her and use the term dreadlocks. I mean, specifically, talk about her choice of locks and why it's important to use the right term. Right. I had the same experience with my sister who had locks for many years and was very adamant about calling them locks rather than dreads or dreadlocks. Um, so yeah, dreadlocks have this long history of being stigmatized, of being treated as somehow um, unclean, um, dirty um, in some way. Um, so yes, this is a revolutionary moment in that sense. But um, Jackson's locks in particular are a style called sister locks which were created yeah. by Joanne Cornwell. And it's a, it's a different technique that's used to create them. 
Um, it has a similar appearance that we might be used to from more traditional sorts of dreadlocks, but it is a particular technique and a particular style. And one thing that stands out about this style to me is that as far as natural hairstyles go, it's kind of expensive in terms of how to get it started and then how to maintain it. And there aren't as many people that are trained in um, starting this style and maintaining it, for helping you to maintain it. So it's a little bit different than um, other types of dreadlocks and other natural hairstyles too. It's so, so true. And I, I right now my mother has sister locks. And so when I see Judge Jackson, I see my own mother reflected back at me. Um, does Judge Jackson's hair help normalize natural hairstyles in corporate and workplace settings, which is a huge deal. I mean, we just had the Crown Act pass. It, it seems like this needs to be like, stop asking me about my hair, how it grows on my head and how I choose to wear it, please. Definitely. Um, I think that a lot of us, the way you started this segment, thinking about like young black girls and women watching um, this, these hearings and looking at the nomination that happened earlier and think and being able to see themselves in her, like that's pretty transformative in and of itself to be able to see yourself um, in someone in this sort of position or be able to see your sister or your mother um, in, in that position. Um, so yes, I do think that this sort of moment goes a long way to normalize a look, um, to say, look, don't be surprised when you see me at the department meeting or the board meeting or showing up for an interview that this isn't really a topic of conversation um, let alone a point of contention in terms of whether I'll be hired or whether I'll be promoted. Um, I think this is a critical moment, a critical statement in that regard. It's so, so true because in the law in particular, I remember learning a specific rule. When you go for a job interview, you have to wear a blue suit or a black suit and you should have your hair up in a very neat style. I mean, this is directions literally that I got. And it wasn't like I graduated a long time ago. This is a really important thing. Um, there's also a long standing tradition of judges appearing a very particular way, black robes, dress shoes, collars. I mean, what does this moment mean for young women and girls of color who rock their natural hair that they can see somebody really being their true authentic self, even as they, I mean, the fact that she was wearing cobalt today, which I see that you're also wearing, um, you know, that also stood out to me as, as something that um, was important as well. Yeah, it is important. And that image just says so much that we have in our minds what a judge wears and what they look like. What we don't take, um, what we don't take into consideration is sometimes that's racialized and that's gendered, that it's not just the black robe and the gavel, that um, oftentimes people will imagine someone white or they'll imagine a man or they'll imagine an older white man or something. So it's really pivotal, pivotal that other bodies occupy that space. That doesn't mean that the robe is gone, but some of that other baggage that goes along with that imagery that's highly racialized, that's highly gendered, those things get called into question. I mean, in the ideal world, I wish we didn't have to talk about this, even though I love talking about natural hair. I wish we didn't have to say, like, we're normalizing the way your hair grows out of your head naturally. Like, why, are we, why do we need to normalize the way my, my hair grows? That's silly. Um, but do you, you think we're actually going to get to a point through progress like this where women could just wear their hair how they want and nobody says anything? Um, I do think we're moving toward that, um, especially with the Crown Act and that legislation, um, that first there has to be some acknowledgement that there is an issue, that there has been an issue, that racism isn't just about your skin tone, that it's also about texturism, your, the, uh, the texture of your hair, the style of your hair, your facial features. We have to have this more complex, nuanced understanding of racism before we can get to that place where we don't have to have these conversations um, that, like what we're having today. Professor Robin Autry, I appreciate uh, the nuance and expertise you brought to this conversation. It's so cool to see this, and I'm so glad to have you on this historic day. Thank you for being here. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on The Choice from MSNBC. Hi, I'm 
Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.